Well, I don't know why you're complaining about working on Valentine's Day, Gavin. We're podcasters. Nobody's going to date us. Ass. The following podcast contains... You cannot say filth, flying filth, flying filth in front of people. Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you showed up with a box of chocolates and a dozen roses to your kink.com hookup, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host Dave Bledsoe and this is a Friday, February 14th, 2020, What a Fool Believes edition of the show, where I give advice to the lovelorn, loveless, and losers all. Stay tuned. Please. What the hell are you thinking? Podcast is brought to you by Fast Eddie's Instant Date. Are you unattractive, overweight, suffer from bad skin, receding hairlines, walk with a limp, stutter profusely, or just generally unlikable? Don't worry. Fast Eddie's Instant Date will find someone for you or your money back. At Instant Date, we pride ourselves on being the service of last resort. None of our clients are anything less than utterly desperate. We find unwanted beggars can't be choosers, but you would be surprised how many losers there are in the world. So if you are unlucky at love and at life, come over to Fast Eddie's Instadate, where we promise we will find someone who will hate you as much as you hate yourself, but still wants to give it a shot. Unless you're an incel, we aren't miracle workers. It's just drinking and bonding games. It's fun. It's fun for you. It's not fun for me. I don't know. Maybe we should just... Maybe we should just... Just investigate different people. Did you really just say that? Did you really just say that? You want to investigate other people? That's what you want? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we should just... We should just branch out. Okay? Just sow our oats a little. Sow our cop oats. Look, I have an in with Zook. We have a thing and it's good. And I, I don't know. Maybe I should just stay closer to him. And you should do your thing. With your connections and channels. With Cynthia's roommate. You should see if she knows who sold her drugs. I just, I just don't, I don't like the idea of us doing stuff separately. Oh, look, we can still investigate together. It's just, you know, now it'll be an open thing. You want an open investigation? I don't know if that's what I want. All right? I just think it's healthy right now for us to try it. Catch you later then. Oh, I remember my first crush. I don't remember her name or what she looked like, but I remember having my first crush. Aw, that's so sweet. It was seventh grade, and she sat next to me in homeroom, and come Christmas, I saved up a little money, and in consultation with my mom, I bought a small gift to show her that I was thinking of her. A lighted makeup compact because it was the 80s and that's what people did. I wrapped it carefully and on the last day of school before Christmas break, I gave it to her like it was no big deal. I'll never forget the look on her face when I did that mix of confusion and revulsion that I would come to know so well for so many years to come. Okay, this took a turn. She opened the gift, looked at it, dropped it in her bag and never said another word to me for the rest of the school year. They say you learn a lot from your first loves. They do? Or at least I learned a lot from my first loves, and what I learned was that I was very bad at communicating to girls that I liked them. I was awkward, chubby, played Dungeons and Dragons, and possessed a singularly unfortunate amount of bright red curly hair that as a small child made me adorable and cherubic, but as an adolescent made me very... Dorky. It didn't help that I was always in a time crunch to get people to like me in general since we moved around so much, and girls rarely got to see the inner me, which I am forced to admit was a lot like the outer me. No, it's really dorky. I mean, I talked a lot about Tolkien and Star Trek, and while today having mad Dungeon Master skills and an encyclopedic knowledge of the USS Enterprise NCC 1701's deck plans will totally get you laid, in 1983, it would not. So 
I was consigned to the halls of nerdity for most of my preteen and teen years where I was actually quite happy because the real upside of knowing girls don't like you is you didn't waste a lot of time wondering whether or not girls liked you. Of course, the flip side of that is when they did like you, it made you utterly oblivious to their attention. So again, I apologize to you, Agnes Flores of Guam, who tried really, really hard that last year. It wasn't you. It was me. I was trapped in the dork cycle. When I finally got my growth spurt late in high school and grew into my way and took up smoking and hanging out with stoners, I did a little better on the romance front, but by that time I was a raging ball of hormones and far more obsessed with the idea of girls than the actual girls, and definitely more obsessed with the idea of their boobs, boobs. boobs, boobs, boobs. than the actual person with said boobs, I was a real mess. If it weren't for the combined sexual frustration of, of myself and Mormon girls and the relative seclusions of a photography darkroom leading to some rather innocent and low-level behavior, I wouldn't have had any experience at all. And by the time I would normally be setting to lean into what for, would be the proper time for a steady relationship in high school, I already had one foot out the door to Air Force basic training rather than to college or working in the local area, so I could only make do with short-term and rather chaste relationships. Mormon girls' sexual frustrations only went so far, after all. All this to say is I never had the training required to be proficient at being romantic. I knew a lot of theories, but much of that theory came from rather dubious sources. Yeah. Please, no, this is the late 80s. It wasn't nearly accessible enough to form any kind of lasting impression on my psyche. No, my sources were much worse. Fantasy books. This explains so much about you. It really does. My ideas about how to be a good boyfriend or how to be romantic and all that kind of shit came from the kind of books I read. And I don't know if you've read a lot of fantasy, but the role models aren't great. They come in only two flavors, the hyperbolic demonstra demonstrative chivalric hero or the cocky brooding anti-hero. Think Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. I wanted to be Han Solo, but I was very much a Luke. So when I accidentally fell into my first long-term relationship with a nice young woman named Michelle, I went over the cliff with flowers and affection for someone that I liked, very much liked having sex with, but had no intention of marrying. The problem was, I never communicated that with her. So she rather naturally assumed that someone who behaved like I did was, you know... <laughs> And she started talking about meeting families and maybe getting an apartment together. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down. Where did this come from? And then I more or less ghosted her out of fear of commitment. It was so easy to ghost somebody in the 80s. You have no idea. I guess what I'm trying to say is I was very bad at relationships when I was younger. And I never really got better at them. I mean, I've fallen in love couple of times I even thought I might go big or go home, right, bud? But I always went home, which is great because I like being single. I always have. No joke, even if I were with someone now, which I'm not, I would still need my own space because if I'm around someone too much, they will rapidly figure out that I'm, you know, kind of an asshole. Find a, I find that a little space keeps the best part of me public facing while the worst part of me, the real me, some people might say, safely away from other people. Very few people in my life, only those closest to me, see Private Dave, and they're like, I don't like him. I just don't like him. But have learned to accept Private Dave by avoiding him. What this emotional and intellectual distance from other rom romantic relationships does do, however, is make me incredibly good at helping people with their relationships. How does that work him? I don't know, but it really does. I think it's because I've made so many mistakes in my relationships that I've done them all and can spot and identify them very easily. Also, I have no real interest in pretending to love people when I don't, and there's no sugarcoating it in my advice. If I say the relationship is doomed, trust me, it's doomed. You are an awful human being. No one disputes that in the least. 
So since I'm at a used car lot in Queens, they call a podcast studio and recording a show on Valentine's Day, which is a corporate holiday designed to keep candy card and flower companies in business through the depths of winter, instead of out with someone that I might have sex with later on tonight, I thought I would take this show, this show to answer some listener questions about their relationships and provide the kind of helpful advice that has caused so many people I know to break up with their significant others over the past few years. Ow. How is this a positive thing? For them, maybe not so much. But for me, two words. Rebound sex. An awful human being. I'm kidding. That doesn't happen much. Though, come on. We've all done it. Everyone has or had that one friend that they know that if the relationship went tits up, you would be there for them, or they would be there for you. And before too long, you guys were making the beast with two backs to help them get over it. What? No, no. Liars. All of these questions are very real and not at all made up, and each person had reached out for help with this particular problem. Admittedly, not all of them to this podcast, but this is a podcast that cares, so I'm giving them my, vi- my advice anyway. And before we start, I should tell you, I'm not a therapist. I'm an angry drunk that lives along with a cat that sometimes shits in his bed and finds turds in his sheets. So you should take this advice with a grain of salt. Is everyone ready for some advice for the lovelorn? Let's hit it, Gavin. Dear Dave, I've been dating a nice woman in her mid-30s for several weeks now. We get along really, really well, have great physical chemistry and so much in common. But she is a baby talker. She uses childish words and phrases in times and places where they're not appropriate. And what is worse, she says them in a childish voice. During a dinner with my co-workers recently, she excused herself from the table by saying she had to, quote, go make a tinkle. She says things like this all the time and it's driving me crazy. Signed, I love Lily, but I hate baby talk. Dear baby talk. There's something mentally wrong with someone over the age of four who says they have to make tinkle. Now, you say you've got great chemistry, but come on. Let's just admit the reality here. She fucks like a coked up weasel, doesn't she? Of course she does. I dated a woman back in the 90s who used baby talk all the fucking time. She was a smoking hottie, and I told her for a week in bed, and she was absolutely batshit crazy. One night, she set her closet on fire while I was asleep because she thought her teddy bear told her to. I know that crazy in the head is good in the bed, but it is bad for your chances for not being burned alive. Baby talk, break it off. Break it off now. Take it from me. Be prepared to file a restraining order and maybe, maybe, not saying I had to do this, but move to another town in the middle of the night and change your name. God damn. But if she showed up today, fuck her again. Dear Dave, so brah. Totally convinced my girlfriend that we should have a threesome with this chick I met at the Wawa where I work. I know, right? Turns out, bro, it wasn't awesome. Like, my chick was, like, really super into Brenda from the Wawa, and the two of them kind of forgot I was there. I mean, it was kind of cool and shit watching them go out of like that. And Yeah, bro, I totally nutted from jerking it. But now my girlfriend, she and Brenda, they're, like, meeting up two or three nights a week and spending all night together. Dude, I think she might be cheating on me with another guy or something. What should I do, bro? Any, any way I can, like, convince them to pay attention to me the next time that we have a threesome? Thanks, brah. So, I want to get comfortable with having threesomes now. Dear threesomes. No, 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 wait, come on. I'm going to call you Trey because your name is, like, Trey or Chad or Brad or something like that. But I've got to tell you, Trey, first of all, what did you think was going to happen, dude? I mean, you sound like a guy that could barely find his way around one clitoris. So adding a second clitoris was never going to work out for you. Sadly, I too had to learn this the hard way during a particularly sordid evening with two older women I met while singing karaoke. I learned things that night that I will never unlearn, even though I wish I could. Brah, threesomes are rarely the answer to your boring relationships. I hear from a lot of people about how they think they can help, but really the problem is that you don't need another person in your bed, that you want a different person in your bed. 
Also, stop with this porn idea that having two chicks in your bed is with you is going to be about them both sucking your dick at the same time. We've all seen that porn, but also you've seen your dick. There isn't enough of it to go around, brah. Not going to work. If you go into a relationship where threesomes are on the table, great. But if suddenly someone brings them up six months in, yeah, it's time to start sorting your DVDs. Also, Trey, got some bad news for you about your girlfriend. But to your girlfriend, I hope that you and Brenda are super happy together. You are so much better off without this loser. Dear Dave, having recently come into some money, I took a cruise to escape my troubles. During the cruise, I met the most amazing woman and we really hit it off. I think we may be in love. So I told her the truth about how I came into my money, which uh, wasn't exactly legal. Long story short, she's a police officer who says that she has no choice but to turn me in when we reach Los Angeles. What do I do? I could probably slip off the boat to the next port, but I think she may be the one. Help, signed. I love the law. Dear law lover, you clearly have a problem. And the biggest of which you thought you could trip me up with this because this was ripped off from season one, episode 18 of The Love Boat, the last of the Stubing's million dollar man and the sisters when Bill the embezzler meets Susie the cop and they were played by Frank Converse and Marcia Strassman. The day hasn't dawned when someone can trip me up with a Love Boat plot, motherfuckers. Exciting and new Come aboard We're expecting you Dear Dave, I'm really into this guy in my D&D group. We've been gaming together for a while now and he's super sweet. I keep dropping hints that I like him, but he never seems to get them. So finally, I just asked him out to a movie, and he said, great, and then asked the other guys in our group if they wanted to go, too. How do I get through to this guy, or is he too nerdy to ever figure it out? Signed. God, I'm in love with a nerd. <laughs> Dear nerd lover, you really are never going to let this go, are you, Agnes? I was 14, for Christ's sake, and I was a total dweeb. I didn't think any girl would ever like me. Besides, I was afraid of girls back then. And now? Still pretty scared of them, actually. All right, now, time for one last question. And I've noticed that most advice columnists save the whopper for the very last. And I'm no different, despite largely making these up out of whole cloth. So here we go with the mega question. Dear Dave, some years ago, I met a man at a bar in New York City. We spent the evening together getting pleasantly hammered. He was funny, acerbic, quick-witted, and loved to pretend he was a bad boy. But I could tell he had a heart of gold. We spent one glorious evening together and I never saw him again. Imagine my surprise when a few weeks later I missed my period. Nine months later I had a, my beloved baby Jay. He was beautiful with a mop of reddish curls, hazel green eyes, and a hint of a dimple. He's the spitting image of his father right down to the mischievous laugh when he's doing something he shouldn't be. He never tried to track down his father. Didn't have a number, we were just a drunken hookup after all. It had a name, it was a pretty common name, and every time I see my son, though, I think of him. Imagine my surprise when, years later, I'm scrolling through podcasts to see a name in a face I never thought I would see again. I listened to the show, and it was definitely him. Jay's dad, that same laugh, the same wit that I remember from that night so long ago. Do I reach out to tell him that he's a father? Is it worth it? Do you think he would want to know? Signed. Hi, surprise. <laughs> yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Huh. Dear surprise. It really depends. I mean, is he the kind of guy that would definitely make sure not to come in you because... I think he might be. I mean, <laughs> what if the guy in question clearly remembers stopping to get condoms at the Dwayne Reed? Because he always stops at condoms to get Dwayne Reed's. And when he goes home with someone, beside who's to say that the guy didn't have a vasectomy when he was younger? Did you ever think about that? I mean, he might not to, He might not have, but he totally could have. I mean, it would imply that you could be wrong about <laughs> who you think the father is, but in a you gig universe, strange shit happens. So I wouldn't rush towards revelations or anything. And also, 
<laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Do you want your kid to know his dad is a podcaster? I mean, assuming that this podcaster is the dad here. <laughs> but come on, tell your kid that his dad couldn't make an open mic circuit. To, had, had to start a podcast isn't something you want to inflict on a kid. Better to wait till he's grown up and tell them after this possible podcast father has shut down the show and moved out west to grow magic mushrooms in Oregon under a different name. What I'm saying is, <laughs> surprise, it's best not to rush into these things. Let's wrap the segment here, Gavin. Where did that come from? That wasn't in the original script that I had. As you can see, love is complicated and there are no easy answers. What works for me probably won't work for you unless you're the sort of person that likes drinking in a used car lot in Queens every Friday. Then you should definitely follow my advice. But what you should not do is buy into the idea that Valentine's Day is this big fucking thing you should have to do every year. I mean, Mother's Day, I get that. She pushed out your fucking kid or she pushed you out. So buy some fucking flowers and make some goddamn breakfast. But Valentine's Day, it's a scam. If you can only tell, you can only bother to tell someone that you love them once, maybe twice a fucking year because the planet is positioned in its orbit, then maybe you don't love that person that much in the fucking first place. Clearly, this has all been for funsies. I don't have an illegitimate child out there that I'm remotely aware of. But if I had any real advice to give, it would be start like you mean to go on. If you're the flower buying kind of person, cool, but be prepared to keep that up. If you're the kind of person who likes to cook for the person you're with, great. But don't get pissy when they don't cook for you in return. If you're the kind of person who's huggy and kissy in public when you first start dating someone, you best be ready to do that shit for the entire time you're with that person. Otherwise, you're in for a long talk when you stop doing it. Try talking to your significant other before you need to get to the point where you write an advice columnist or God help you a podcaster. You would be surprised what you can accomplish with a simple, open conversation with a person you say you're in love with. I mean, they're the actual person that they're dealing with your shit and you with theirs. Their input on your problems is going to be infinitely more accurate than some rando on the Internet. I'm looking at you, Reddit. I'm looking at you. And one last piece of advice before we go. If you've ever had a one-night stand with a portly, acerbic internet radio personality that resulted in a child and were wondering if you should tell him, the answer will always be no. Trust me, it's better for me, it's better for you, and it is definitely better for the kids that way. Support for this podcast comes from Qualcomm Incorporated. As the world's leading wireless technology innovator, Qualcomm brought you 3G, 4G, and 5G, inventing many technologies inside the mobile devices you love. Get an inside look at 5G, a technology that can allow nearly everything and everyone to communicate and interact seamlessly on the Qualcomm podcast. Dig into the inventions and opportunity of 5G and get a behind-the-scenes look at the future of wireless. I think it's a privilege, a company like Qualcomm, that uh, we work in telecom, we work in communications, and um, not only through this uh, pandemic, which is a very difficult situation, but through, through our history, we have seen how much the technology we work on can actually change society and help. If you love technology, you'll love the Qualcomm Podcast. Listen to the Qualcomm Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or SoundCloud. Support for this podcast comes from Goldman Sachs. What do Goldman Sachs experts and leading thinkers have to say about trends shaping markets, industries, and the global economy? Stay informed with the latest insights from Goldman Sachs on the economic and market implications of COVID-19. Available on our podcasts at gs.com slash COVID-19 or any of your favorite podcast platforms. That is it for our show this week. Happy Hallmark holiday to all you lovers out there. If nothing else, I hope that you fuck tonight. Fuck all wet and nasty. Each of you with one of your ear pods in an ear listening to the sound of my voice. I think I'm gonna puke. And as soon as you're done, roll off of one another all sweaty and sticky. Then rate and review the show wherever you get your pods and mention that you were boning to it. Let people know the kind of person you actually are. Follow the show on Twitter at the hell underscore podcast or the show name on Facebook for a real fun, sexy time. 
Stick a dollar on our G-string at patreon.com slash what the hell podcast and click what the hell podcast.com for some tasteful nudes of producer Gavin. And so for me, Dave, sentimental fool, Bledsoe, producer, never made her think twice, Gavin, and all the fictional believing fools we want to say, a wise man has the power to reason away what seems to be better than nothing. And we'll see you all next week. for this, so I take a small bow.